NSRC wireless. How to make wireless work with really, really limited means, limited budgets. How to build wireless infrastructure on a really, really small budget. This will be about presenting some best practices, some acceptable practices that might not be the best, but they might work for you for certain purposes. There'll also be some fun practices, things that are educational, worth doing, even though you might not want to deploy them for the longer run for bigger projects. This first picture here is an example from a workshop in South Africa in 2005, if I remember correctly. And while this is all taped together and definitely not the way you would want to do this for any real project, this worked. And this worked for six kilometers. I think we could stretch it to 10 kilometers. Why does this work? Well, here is a bit of a reference to the wireless foundations lecture. Here's a link budget and you can look through these items in the link budget. You have a standard transmission of 20 dBm. You have not so good cables and connectors. You have antennas that we estimate and we'll get back to that at being around 10 dBs and if you Adding all of this up, you end up with a 9 dB link margin over a distance of, say, 10 kilometers. Now, that's very tight. That's not really enough for a stable link with margin for rainfall and so forth. But it just about works. And that was the purpose of what we did in this workshop back then. Let's get to maybe the most important question. Is it worth building your own wireless infrastructure? Is it worth engaging in do-it-yourself things? Um, when is it worth it? What parts are interesting? Uh, now, in general, we have the three main elements here to look at the access points or wireless routers. That's definitely something you will have in any wireless network. You have a software layer, you have the management systems, the systems that help you maintain the network, manage users, manage bandwidth, manage the whole network. And you have, as a relatively simple and maybe the most visible part, antennas, of course. Now, APs and wireless routers. You can, in principle, build these yourself. Many APs and wireless routers are de facto Linux boxes. They are modified, specialized Linux boxes. You can build these yourself from general purpose, embedded systems, embedded boards, embedded small computers by adding the radio card, the, the Wi-Fi card. However, you will not be able to save a lot of money here. Uh, it tends to be the other way around that the mass production, simply because of the numbers, um, has led to Wi-Fi equipment being cheaper as a you know, a, a small Linux embedded board, then a general purpose board that you could buy independently to then turn it into a Wi-Fi box. So you shouldn't hope to, to save a lot of money here. It might still be interesting to do, but it's not where you save on budget. Uh, what might be worth it is looking into older gear that you, that you find lying around somewhere, repurposing gear. With one big warning though, you need to be aware of if you're trying to build a network out of things that you find here and there, you will run into 
issues of maintaining this, managing this. Imagine you have a network built out of 10, 20, 50 different pieces, all different vendors, all different models, no unified interface to them. This will be very, very difficult to do. The reason it's still interesting sometimes to do that is that you might have isolated parts of your network, like a cafe hotspot, a visitor's lounge or something, where you can treat the system as fairly much standalone, independent. And for these things, looking at older gear might still make sense. And keep in mind that the newest and fastest and fanciest isn't always the best. The reason I'm saying this, very often we are struggling with transporting all the data that we're accumulating on the wireless network through our backhaul connections, our uplink to our ISP, for example. So sometimes using relatively old gear that naturally keeps the speeds down might be quite a relevant uh, idea. Let me show you something here. We have some old, very old, 20 year, years roughly. Uh, these are the Linksys, the famous blue boxes. They got so famous because they were so nicely hackable. They were the first that actually opened up their firmware, which is essentially Linux. So they were forked into many, many different ones. And some of my oldest ones here, like I said, 20 years, and they're still working and they're still doing a certain jobs. So you might look into finding such old gear to repurpose, but repeating the warning, be aware that you need to manage this, maintain this somehow, which will not be trivial if you have a mix of 10, 20 different things. Speaking of management and software for that, there is a lot you could actually do, although not many people do it, to use standard tools and elements, tools that we're talking about, for example, in network management and monitoring and in general system administration. You can use these tools to actually manage a variety of networking gear. Tools I'm thinking about here include things like SNMP, SSH, uh, remote procedure, execution over SSH, DHCP servers, firewalls, monitoring, um, and many of these ingredients put together, and most of them are open source and freely usable, might actually help you maintaining and managing such improvised networks in the absence of a real enterprise management system. With that, let me come to the last and probably most popular field of doing your own do-it-yourself wireless, the antennas. Whether it's worth doing that, this depends a lot on your ambition level, what you compare it with in terms of budget, like is it worth saving $10 on something? What means, what does $10 mean to you? How expensive is your labor cost if you needed to hire some, someone to do something? How much money can you save on what? All these questions. And they go into projects in many, many different ways. You can't compare one to the other. It really depends on your um, location, your situation, your budget, your background, your people, your skills. So there's no one good answer for that, whether it's worth it. In the relatively privileged world, I'm talking to you from Europe, there's hardly a reason, hardly a motivation 
to spend time on building your own antennas simply because the cost of an off-the-shelf antenna compared to the cost of labor doesn't make it attractive. But that might be completely different depending on where you are and that decision obviously is up to you. Now what are we comparing, what are we up against in terms of cost? The small Omni rubber duck antennas, again let me show this kind of thing here, right? Um, these are antennas that cost a dollar or two. Um, they're really, really inexpensive. They're also very weak. They're maybe two, three dBs at best. Um, not, they're not serious antennas. They are small antennas for a local hotspot for a couple of ten meters or something. Strong outdoor omni antennas, 20, 30, 50 dollars. Patch panel antennas, somewhat the same, 20, 30 dollars. The really strong outdoor antennas, 50 to hundreds of dollars. So that becomes more interesting to consider replacing them by something you can build yourself. If you're buying antennas and also if you're building your own, and especially if you then want to compare the performance of these antennas, always remember to check them, to measure them, to look at data sheets if it's purchased commercial antennas, data sheets, measurement protocols and so forth.